Hello and welcome. First, I'd like to apologize for my raspy voice. I never noticed my voice was raspy until I started recording my voice. So again, my apologies. In this video, we are going to try and read Karen Reed's body language and her overall behavior. Karen Reed's murder trial began in April and more than a dozen witnesses have taken the stand in the case where the 44-year-old is accused of murder in connection with the death of her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe. She's accused of murdering him in front of a house full of police officers during a snowstorm. It's an insane case. If you want to know more about this case, I have a playlist about the Karen Reed case. I will put the link to that playlist in the comments below the video. If you're interested in other true crime, I have several true crime playlists. I will link them below as well. If you like this video and my content, please like, subscribe, comment, and set the notification bell to all so you won't miss any new videos and premieres. I noticed that a lot of my subscribers don't get notified of new videos, so please make sure to set the bell to all. Thanks so much. Let me first just say this. I am not a professional at this. The statements I make in this video are my opinion. I've watched a lot of true crime, I think hundreds, maybe thousands of true crime videos and TV shows by now. So I hope I gained some knowledge from just watching all those shows also about body language. And I am Dutch, so if I make a little mistake every now and then language wise, I apologize and I hope you'll forgive me for that. So let's get back to the case. It's important to note that we don't know how much was edited in this original interview. It makes a huge difference whether a conversation is shown uncut or whether it has been edited, which means parts can be cut out, some parts of the clip may be moved, etc. And I don't know if she made sure to see the footage before giving consent to broadcast. These are all facts to take into consideration before and while analyzing these clips. So let's go to clip number one. I did not kill John O'Keefe. I've never harmed a hair on John O'Keefe's head. She nods affirmatively while speaking in the first clip. However, she does tilt her head slightly backwards, which, in my opinion, seems to show that she's not fully convinced of what she's saying here. But it can also be a sign of arrogance. But it's also possible that her attorneys rehearsed this so many times with her that her body language is a bit unnatural at times. So we cannot rule that out completely. We'll never know, unfortunately. But even then, even if they rehearsed this a hundred times, she would still be nervous for this interview. And it's very, very hard to, to maintain using body language that was rehearsed. It's nearly impossible because the body mostly just takes over while we speak especially in a situation of stress, like an interview setting about a murder you allegedly committed would be. Let's talk a bit about her eye blinking rate. She is blinking a lot in this short time and very fast. I counted seven times in which one time she kept her eyes closed just a little bit longer, which indicates that she's trying to create a distance between herself and what she says, in my opinion. Let's watch in slow motion to be sure how many times she blinks. I did not kill 
Toronto Keith. I've never had a hair on Toronto Keith's head. Did you count? It's seven times indeed. What also comes to mind, if someone gets thirsty during a stressful interview, it's believed they are probably lying because the mouth gets dry. So they need to drink. When lying, people tend to experience a severe dry mouth and as a result, they may frequently lick their lips. Now, this is something that you may not always catch because it's something that happens very quickly. So I was wondering if the mouth gets dry, maybe the eyes get dry too. And is that possibly a reason for blinking a lot? If a body language professional is watching this, please let us know if this is true. And please do a video about her body language in this interview. Because like I said, I am not a professional and I'd love to learn more about this. What I also noticed in this clip is that she says his full name twice in a relatively short time, in two sentences. She says John O'Keefe. He was her boyfriend, so it would be natural to refer to him as John. To say it once at the beginning of the sentence is not that strange in a formal situation like this, but to say it again is noteworthy and a bit strange, to say the least. I think it stems from talking to her lawyers, because this is typically how an attorney would phrase sentences like this. I think it also shows that this was rehearsed her attorneys probably told her to say this exactly in this fashion. So I really think this was a rehearsed part. So let's take a look at the second clip. Firefighter said that you said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. I said, I hit him. It was preceded by a did and proceeded by a question mark. Unfortunately, we cannot see what her arms are doing because we only see the top part of her body in most parts of these clips. Um, in this second clip, she says, I said I hit him. It was preceded by a did and proceeded by a question mark. This seems very rehearsed to me because who even says a sentence like this? attorneys do. This was very likely made up by her attorneys and if she is lying here it's a very clever find to add these words to this sentence and it can definitely raise reasonable doubt which is all the defense has to do. They don't have to prove anything. That burden is on the prosecution. She's trying extremely hard to convince us of how she thinks this happened. Her eyes are super big. Her eyebrows are pulled up very high. She's in convince mode here. She's also nodding her head a lot, which is consistent with telling the truth in this way. Her head affirms what her mouth is telling us, so to speak. Several witnesses have testified that she said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. So this is a difficult one because both parties say the opposite thing. Firefighter said that you said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. I said, I hit him. It was preceded by a did and proceeded by a question mark. So let's watch the third and the fourth clip. What I thought could have happened was that did I incapacitate him unwittingly, somehow, and then in his drunkenness, passed out? Is it possible that you might have hit him unwittingly in your admittedly very large SUV? No, not possible. Something very weird is happening here. I haven't heard anyone about this and I watched a lot of videos about her. She contradicts herself in these next parts and not just a little bit. There's no room for interpretation. 
she is a hundred percent contradicting what she says in these two parts. Let's watch and see if you notice it too. What I thought could have happened was that did I incapacitate him unwittingly somehow and then in his drunkenness passed out? Is it possible that you might have hit him unwittingly in your admittedly very large SUV? No, not possible. Did I incapacitate him unwittingly is a very distanced way of speaking about a very emotional and disturbing occur occurrence. Incapacitating is a cold way of saying this in my opinion. If it's your boyfriend and you love him, you're not gonna say it like this, I think. Maybe we hear the attorneys talking here again? Because I don't think you talk about incapacitating your boyfriend. It sounds so cold, so distanced. And then she says, and then in his drunkenness passed out. She doesn't say he passed out. This may indicate deception. Leaving out personal pronouns is a way to create distance between what she says or alleges and how it really happened. Easier said, it can be a sign of deception. She puts her hand on her heart or chest. This physical gesture is usually seen as a true indicator of a sincere, loving thought. However, the fact that she left out the pronoun contradicts this, which can be a sign of deception. When she says passed out in his drunkenness, she shrugs her shoulders very visibly. Why do people shrug their shoulders when talking? It serves a nonverbal expression of uncertainty, indifference or lack of knowledge. Typically, a shoulder shrug is accompanied by raised eyebrows or a slight head tilt, further emphasizing the speaker's confusion or ignorance. However, beneath its surface lies a potential indicator of deception. We see her raised eyebrows and her head is even tilted slightly when she pulls up her shoulders. Right after the shoulder lift, she puts her hand on her heart or chest. She's not doing this while talking about this matter. She does it right after. It could be a sign that putting the hand on her heart was rehearsed because normally you would put your hand on your heart while speaking about the matter it concerns, not after. You may think this is far-fetched, but she has a hell of an attorney team. They are winning this case for her, in my opinion, and it wouldn't surprise me if they went as far as rehearsing this interview with her including putting the hand on her heart to look genuine and honest and caring. Did you see the contradiction I was talking about a few minutes ago? First, she says she thought she may have hit him. But when the interviewer suggests this same hypothesis, she says no, and not just no. She says it without any doubt. A huge contradiction in my opinion. What do you think? Let's watch it again. What I thought could have happened was that did I incapacitate him unwittingly somehow and then in his drunkenness passed out? Is it possible that you might have hit him unwittingly in your admittedly very large SUV? No, not possible. Please let me know what your thoughts are after watching this last clip and all the other clips as well, if you can. Did you see something I didn't see, maybe? Do you see things differently? I'd love to know. I have more clips of this same interview. Please let me know in the comments if you would like a part two and whether you would like that soft spoken like this one or whispered because that's an option too. 
If you liked this video, please leave a like, a comment, set the notification bell to all so you won't miss any new videos, live streams and premieres. You would help me a lot by sharing this video on your social media, such as Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, etc. Facebook. I'm trying to grow my channel, so every share helps. And about premieres, I am going to do a live stream soon, discussing some documents from either Rex Ewerman, Brian Koberger, and maybe some other cases like Madeline Soto. So it's good to have your notification bell set to all so you won't miss those live streams. Since some time it's possible to become a member of my channel, a great way to support me. You can become a member for just one euro 99 per month, which is the same as just two dollars and 16 cents. It makes it possible for me to put more time and effort into this channel. But if you don't want that, that's fine too, of course. I'm already so happy and grateful that you're watching this video and hopefully some more videos on my channel. There are several true crime playlists, such as true crime ASMR, true crime not ASMR, the Shanda Vander Ark trial, the Wade Wilson trial, the Murdoch trial, the Chad Daybell trial, and of course this trial, Karen Reed. If you have any requests for cases you want me to cover, please let me know. If you have other requests, please let me know too. I love suggestions and I love feedback, as long as you keep it classy. Goodbye for now, have a great rest of your day. Toodaloo! Toodles, ta ta, ta ta, ta ta. All about the sound and tingles.